As I mentioned before our Bible study this morning, I'll mention again at this time, I want to wish all of the mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers that are with us today a very happy Mother's Day. Hope that you get to spend some time with your loved ones today and cherish the relationship that you have together. Mothers are very special people. We need to always cherish the relationship that we have with them. I'm going to be honest with you. I had intended to preach a different sermon this morning. But after the things that have transpired in our state the last two days, I felt compelled to change my lesson. You may or may not know of what I'm speaking of. But on Friday, a federal judge in Little Rock struck down from the Arkansas law books that marriage is to be between one man and one woman, thereby making same-sex marriage legal in the state of Arkansas. Yesterday, the county courthouse in Carroll County, Arkansas, which is Eureka Springs, was the very first to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. If I'm not mistaken, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 couples that were married yesterday. There are several other counties that have announced that as of tomorrow morning at the opening of business, they too will begin issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. One positive is that the way that this has come about, each county in the state of Arkansas, each county clerk has the ability to decide whether their county is going to issue same-sex marriage licenses at least at this time. And what that means is if it goes against the conscience or for that matter the religious beliefs of that county clerk, then they do not have to issue those licenses. But that's probably not going to last very long. Brethren, this was a day, today is a day, that I hoped that I would never have to face as a minister of the gospel. And that is to stand before you and say that the state of Arkansas, one that has long been very conservative spiritually and morally, has become the very first state in what is known as the Bible Belt to legalize same-sex marriage. But as we all know, Arkansas is not the first. There are many countries of the world And there are several states, I believe that there are now 12 or 13 states in the United States where homosexuality is celebrated from the standpoint that those couples are recognized as being just as legally married as a husband and wife. But we should not be surprised because this has followed years of progressive moral decline. We look at things like no-fault divorces. You know, for many years you could not get a divorce unless you had a very good reason for it. Now if she burns the biscuits, you can go and get a divorce. Legalized abortion. Trial marriages. Well, we're going to try this for a couple months and if it don't work out, we'll just go and either get it annulled or, or get a divorce. 
the sexual revolution of the 70s, and now the gay rights movement. But brethren, I stand before you today and I say this. The granting of marital status to homosexuals is the greatest downward leap in this long progression of moral perversion. But why should we be concerned about it? Everybody around us is saying, well, what's the big deal? Why does it matter? Well, the purpose of this lesson this morning is this. We are going to consider what kind of view that decent, moral, Christian people ought to have, not just about homosexuality in general, because we know the answer to that question, but specifically about gay marriage. And we're going to look at this from this point of view. What effects are going to come of this? What is going to be the result of same-sex couples having the right to marry? And how is this going to affect you and me, our children, and our grandchildren? I want you to consider with me this morning a few areas. We may not get through all of these, and if we don't, that's okay. But I wanted you to consider a few things. Number one, let's consider the effects upon our moral and religious standards. The moral standards of our society, as I've already mentioned, have been in a great decline for decades. But why is this any different? What is the significant impact that same-sex marriage has on this digression? Well, let's look at it first from this point of view. Brethren, the Bible says that homosexuality not only is immoral, but that it is against nature. Genesis 1, 26-28 shows us that from the days of creation, the sexual union was to be between a male and a female. Homosexuality is an unnatural abuse of that union that God created for men and women. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, 1 Timothy 1, 9-11, We find that homosexuals and sodomites, which essentially are the same thing, they are listed among other sins as being contrary to the Gospel. Contrary to the Word of God. And they will cause people not to inherit the Kingdom of God. Romans 1, 26-27 that Jared read for us a while ago talks about men burning in their lusts after men. It talks about men leaving the natural use of the woman burning in those lusts and then exchanging it for what is against nature. God says that this is a vile passion. He says that it is shameful. He says that it is Error. Now let me pause right here for a moment. I know I'm being very bold in promoting this lesson this morning. And I know chances are with the number of people that are here today, there are some of you that would rather I just shut up and not talk about this any longer. (coughs) But here's the thing. I want you to know from this that even though the things that we are talking about are very serious, we are to be loving toward those individuals. We are to be correcting of those individuals. But we can no longer sit back, shut up, and allow ourselves to be run over by sinful immorality. Notice that Paul says that homosexuality is not just unnatural. He said that it is against or contrary to the very nature of creation. 
God did not create men this way. It is against the order of things that God has put into motion and it can be viewed as nothing less than a gross abuse of the natural order of things. But also, we find that same-sex marriage presents homosexuality as acceptable. Presents it as even being wholesome. In the countries of Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, for several years now, they have recognized same-sex unions. But you talk to those that live in that country today and they realize that it was not just to receive certain civil rights. But it was to force an approval of this action upon the people. It was simply a tactical argument for them to gain approval for their way of life. Brethren, they're not just seeking freedom. They are seeking acceptance of their sins. They are seeking acceptance of what they're doing wrong because they cannot stand to live with the knowledge that the majority of people in this country believe that what they're doing is wrong. And so they are going to do everything in their power to change people's minds, to cause them to view this more civilly, to desensitize them to the heinous nature of this sin. And even cause people to view this as being normal. As morally upright and even admirable. Brethren, if you don't believe that, watch TV sometime. Get on the internet sometime. Just about every day I get on the internet and I see where another celebrity or, or some other influential person has come out of the closet. It's nothing more than shameful. It's shameful. But in contrast to same-sex unions, marriage has been an honored union from the beginning. Sexual activity is intended to remain within the marriage of a husband and a wife. The marriage bed is to remain undefiled. But you look at history, you find that governments have endorsed marriage. Churches have endorsed marriages. They've legalized it. They've solemnized it. Marriage between a husband and a wife is an honorable thing. It is what God intends. And so obtaining that status of homosexuality being acceptable, same-sex couples being given the right to marry, it's simply legitimizing a moral sin. It is us calling right what God calls wrong. But from a biblical standpoint, gay marriage takes a gross moral perversion from the depths of immorality and elevates it to the pinnacle of respectability. Views it as being something that is wholesome, something that is approved by God. But notice what happens when society follows this course. Romans 1, 28-32 And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. God gave up on them. Every society, go back and read history, every society that has reached the point where they praise and accept homosexuality, guess what? They're no longer in existence. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened to ancient Rome? What happened to ancient Greece? They were destroyed. Because as soon as that moral decline begins, it's going to progressively get worse. And we have seen that in the last five years.
being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. There's that homosexuality coming in. Without natural affection. Implaceable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You know, it takes more. It takes more than just a minority for something to become acceptable. It takes the majority either going along with it or not being strong enough to stand against it. Let's look at point number two. What impact is this going to have on marriage itself? The Bible authorizes marriage as an honorable relationship between a man and and a woman. Genesis 2, 18-24 God ordained marriage at the creation. He said that a man is to leave his mother and his father and is to cleave to his wife and they become one flesh. And God said that when He looked upon all of His creations, He saw that it was very good. Genesis 1.31. The New Testament confirms this by in Matthew 19 verses 3 through 9 talking about how the, the bond between a husband and wife is one that is to be lifelong, one that is precious, one that is honorable in the sight of God. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4, Paul tells us that we are to avoid fornication by marrying. By entering into the bonds of marriage, we keep ourselves from sinning in that way. And God here once again shows us that those companions, that that union is to be between two people of the opposite sex. We go back to the beginning. We find that God created man And he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. And notice what God did. Notice He did not mate man with an animal. He did not mate man with another man. He created woman and gave the woman to the man. Brethren, marriage is the only authorized relationship where we have a scriptural right to satisfy the need for lifetime companionship. The only one. But brethren, gay marriage destroys the beauty of marriage. Destroys the honor of marriage because marriage is made equal to a moral perversion. Instead of an honorable companionship, instead of honorable affection that exists between a man and a woman, an immoral, perverted relationship is now being dignified to that same position. But also, brethren, this is only the beginning. There are at least two states in the United States that have legalized same-sex marriage that are now pushing to legalize polygamy, group marriage, pedophilia, and bestiality. On the pedophilia, they say, well, as long as the child consents, then it should be okay. Mark my words, if we don't step up and speak up, one day we'll be seeing this same thing in Arkansas. It's only a few years down the line. What about the effects upon children? Have you even thought about that? God instituted marriage with a purpose in regard to children and it was to protect 
and provide for children. Genesis 1, 26-28 and also Genesis 2 and verse 24, God told male and female to reproduce. He told them that they are to be one flesh, a man and a wife. That one flesh includes in that sexual union, 1 Corinthians 6, 16. And the reason that is, is for the procreation of children. Brethren, another reason that God has instituted this the way that He has is because God intends children to be raised by a mother and a father. Proverbs 1 and verse 8, Children should hear the instruction of their fathers and forsake not the law of their mothers. The fundamental concept of the family that we read about in the Scriptures is a father as the head of the household and the mother who is the one that cares for the basic needs of the child. Now sometimes there are circumstances that are beyond our control. Sometimes one of the parents passes away. Sometimes one of the parents deserts the family. But brethren, that should not be the norm as much as it is today. That should be the exception to the rule. But brethren, I want you to notice this. For us to deliberately choose to make a child grow up without both a father and a mother is irresponsible, unloving, and immoral. But what about the children of homosexuals? Well, how is that even possible? Well, did you know that in the state of Arkansas, homosexuals can be foster parents and adopt children? They also are the main proponents of cloning, surrogate motherhood, artificial insemination, test tube babies, all of these kinds of things. They are the main proponents of it because they cannot have children the natural way. Brethren, they're going to suffer because they are doing without that crucial figure in that home. Whether it is a father or a mother. Now I'm going to tell you this. I know some single fathers that do an outstanding job raising their children. I know some single mothers that do an outstanding job raising their children. But there is no substitute for a faithful Christian mother and father bringing up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. There is no substitute. But how is that going to impact children in general? Well, brethren, our public schools are going to have to become more accepting. They are going to have to promote that type of lifestyle. And as a result, our young people are going to grow up with no sense of morality. They are going to grow up with little parental guidance and they are going to grow up with no idea what a strong family value system is. Brethren, we're going to see more harm come to the family than anything else from this. What about on the church? Number four. The church is responsible to preach the truth. To teach God's Word and oppose evil. 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 and 2 says that an elder in the church must be the husband of one wife. All church leaders must be morally upright. And so logically, no homosexual could serve as a leader in the church. But guess what? There are some religious groups today who are now saying that as long as they are faithful to their same-sex partner, then that is acceptable to God. 
1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, the church is told that we must discipline or correct any member who is guilty of fornication and, and, and homosexuality is simply a form of fornication. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, the church is to be the pillar and the foundation of the truth. But what is happening is that the church, not as much in the Lord's church, but many of the more liberal religious groups are becoming more accepting, are compromising in these areas. We see many that are welcoming practicing homosexuals into full fellowship in their bodies. Some allow them to serve as preachers. Some of them perform marriage ceremonies for same-sex couples. And some even appoint them as leaders. Elders, deacons, bishops, regardless of whatever their hierarchical system within that body is. But I want you to imagine the kind of pressure that's going to be placed on the Lord's church if same-sex marriage continues to be encouraged and legalized. We are going to face persecution. We are going to be pressured to accept homosexual members and leaders. Preachers, those who have been licensed by the state to be able to to perform marriages, we will be pressured to either give up our license or perform same-sex unions. Many will simply give in. Brethren, no faithful congregation of the Lord's church will ever go for this. But we have to realize that it's coming. It's coming. Number five. What about the effects on government and education? I've already mentioned about our public schools. They're run by the government. Did you know that? And so whatever the government says is acceptable, that's what they are going to have to teach. That's what they are going to have to encourage. But the Bible teaches us in 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, and also Romans 13, 1 through 4, that rulers were appointed by God with a purpose, and that is to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Boy, that's a stretch, isn't it? God created authority specifically to protect that which is good. To protect that which is honorable. And brethren, that does not include the propagation of same-sex marriage. We're going to have to move on because we're just about out of time. What about entertainment? Brethren, you can't even turn the TV on anymore and watch a TV show without seeing homosexual praised in some way. People are going to face moral issues of doing business with homosexuals. Are we going to go and do business with someone who knows is living that kind of lifestyle? Or what if we own rent homes or apartments or something like that? Are we going to let... Someone come and stay in that that we know is living that kind of lifestyle. Restaurants are going to have to decide whether they will let meetings of those organizations that promote that take place there. Publishers, florists, photographers, caterers, all this kind of stuff. Are we going to support same-sex marriages? Guess what? It's not here yet. But brethren, Randolph County is going to face this. So what can we do? What must we do in regard to what's taking place? Isaiah said in Isaiah fifty and verse or five and verse twenty, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What better description could there be for what we see taking place in the world around us? 
than what Isaiah has just said. Psalm 11 and verse 3, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, the foundations are being destroyed. The foundation of the family, the foundation of our moral fiber is being destroyed. It's crumbling in ruins as we speak. So what can Christians do? Number one, we need to commit ourselves to believing and practicing God's plan for marriage. Be faithful to your spouse. Honor your spouse. Love your spouse. Treat them the way that they should be treated. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2.24 Teach this plan to your children. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. If you don't want your children to fall prey to this, teach them otherwise. Teach them the truth of God's plan. Insist that the church speaks out on this. Insist that the church defends scriptural marriage and refuses to compromise with error. 1 Timothy 3.15 Paul says, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Yes, there is a way the church is supposed to act. And it's according to the truth of God's Word. Brethren, speak out against this. Speak out openly against what is taking place and rebuke those that are promoting this and defending this. 2 Timothy 4, 2-4 through This isn't just talking about preachers and elders. Paul says, preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Why though? Here's why. Because the time will come. Well, brethren, guess what? The time is here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. That time is here. What else can we do? We need to correct our authority figures. We need to correct those that have been put into positions of authority over us. Acts 24 and verse 25, we see the Apostle Paul doing this with a Roman ruler by the name of Felix. It says that as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. No, Paul was not able to change Felix. But Paul was doing his duty by trying to correct those things. Now, here is where I might get into a little trouble. But I don't think I will. Do not vote people into office that promote this type of sin. Romans 13, 1-5 Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. That's why it's important. Because those that we vote into office are the ones we have to submit to. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good." There are very few of our people in positions of leadership today that I would refer to as a minister of God. We need to think about those things. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth good. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Some other things 
refuse to fellowship or have any part in homosexual marriage. Brethren, I know it's very difficult when we have loved ones who are living that kind of lifestyle not to have anything to do with them. But the Bible teaches us very plainly that if we want to be pleasing to God, then we cannot support that in any way. Ephesians 5.11 Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather correct them. Reprove them of what they're doing. Refuse to participate in any form of entertainment that justifies homosexuality. Going back to that same thing. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. If you know that that movie you're wanting to go and see is promoting homosexuality. If you know that book that you're wanting to read is promoting homosexuality. If you know someone is, is, is living that type of lifestyle and you're going to have anything to do with them. Then you're breaking the Lord's will. Next, parents, this is the one that we really need to pay close attention to. We need to insist, not encourage, we need to insist that those who are teaching our children are not justifying homosexuality. We need to insist that they are teaching our children how to be strong, moral, godly Individuals. Because God put you in charge of training your children. God put mom and dad as the head of those children and it is up to you to determine what they are taught and how they are taught. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And if that means that you have to pull your children out of the public school system and homeschool them, so be it. If it means that you have to pay a little bit of money to send them to a Christian school, so be it. But we cannot allow our children to be influenced by those that are going to teach them immoral things. Now let me just say this. There are many Fabulous teachers in the public school system. Fabulous teachers. But there are also some that fall on the complete other end of that spectrum. We are lucky in this area to for the most part have wonderful teachers. But it's up to us as parents to ensure that our children have that kind of teacher. And that that teacher is teaching our children what they need to be taught. And then just some basic things. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray for your marriage. Pray for your children. Pray for the church. Pray for our leaders. 1 Timothy 2, 1-2 Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Pray for this situation. We want God's intervention. We want God to be there with us. And we need to trust in God. We need to trust that God is going to see us through this. Yes, we must do our part. We can't sit back and say, you know what, God is going to take care of every bit of this. There's separation of church and state. Therefore, as long as I focus on the church and don't worry about the state, everything's going to be okay because God will take care of that. Baloney! That's not true. But we must remember that Paul wrote in Romans 8 and verse 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Do the Lord's will. And remember that no matter what happens in this life, no matter how bad our society may get, ultimately victory belongs to God and belongs to His people. We will be blessed for doing the Lord's will. Matthew 5, 10-12 Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Mark my words. 
persecution's coming. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil things against you falsely for My sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And lastly, and this is what I want to leave you with this morning, I sent out a challenge yesterday whenever I came across this disturbing news. I sent out a challenge to all of my preacher friends on Facebook to get into the pulpit today and speak against what is taking place. But I also issued a secondary challenge and that is this. And this is my challenge to you as well. Call, write, or better yet visit your county clerk. Because in Arkansas at this current point, each county clerk has the option whether they are going to bring same-sex marriage to their county. We do not need this in Randolph County, brethren. We do not need this in the state of Arkansas, but this is something that we can do on the home front to keep this from being right in our front door. Make sure they know that we will not stand with them on this. Make sure that they know that this is against the Lord's will and that if they go along with this, they are supporting the greatest moral perversion that the United States has ever known. This morning, I know that this lesson is one that has not been evangelistic in nature. It's been one that's been more informative. But this morning, if something has been said that has caused you to realize something in your life that is amiss, something in your life that needs to be corrected, that you need to be strengthened and encouraged by your brothers and sisters, that you need to repent and ask God to forgive you of sin in your life, come forward and make that known. We'll do all that we can to help you in getting your life right with God. Or if you realize this morning that you're not a Christian, that you have never accepted the Gospel, and you have faith in God today, come forward, confess that faith that you have, and be baptized. Your sins will be washed away. The Lord will add you to the church this morning. If you examine your spiritual life, and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, Please come while we stand and sing.